Austerity everywhere. Will it fix things? No, it won't. Austerity is the inevitable consequence of the current monetary model. In fact, austerity is the new reality under these dysfunctional models. There can be no other way. You see, we are playing a rigged game, and no amount of sacrifice can ever change that. All economic and political commentators right now propose solutions within the existing paradigm or game. None will work. We either change the game or we perish. Thankfully, we can change the game to not only survive, but to thrive and flourish. First, however, it is time to identify the real problem. An initial process flow of our, of our economy looks like this. It can be scaled up or down to include the whole world or just an individual country. Let's for ease of purposes right now assume it is the country of Ireland. The people and their businesses engage in commerce with each other and also pay taxes to the nation state. The nation state in turn may give grants to businesses, act as employer to the public sector, pay welfare remittances and provide services to the population like education and healthcare. All very noble. Unfortunately, it is at that point that the good news ends. While the diagram represented is how the societal model should exist, it is not how it exists. You see, our nation states, Ireland in this case, should issue the money that is needed within the circle. Unfortunately, the modern nation state around the world does not perform this task. It has outsourced the production of money to third parties. These third parties are all the privately owned central banks of the world. In Ireland, this function was served by the Irish Central Bank until 1999, but now resides with the ECB in Frankfurt. These banks masquerade as public entities, but in all cases are privately owned. So these private central banks issue the money society needs. But the only way money can be issued is if someone somewhere takes on a debt. Either people, businesses or governments. It is worth thinking about that for a moment. Every note that has ever passed through your hands is debt that somebody took on. Even our investments can only grow when someone somewhere takes on debt to purchase goods and services to enable this so-called growth. Therefore, it is clear that money can only cross the line into the circle when debt is taken on. Now, obviously, people and businesses in Ireland never direct, borrow directly from the ECB. We borrow from our local high street banks. They get their authority from the ECB to digitally create debt on a computer screen, be it in the form of mortgages, car loans, business loans, etc. When our government invariably fail to balance their budgets year on year, they borrow directly from the central bank they report to. In Ireland's case, the ECB, in the case of America, the Federal Reserve, England, the Bank of England, etc, etc. This may often happen via the bond market, which is just another layer between government and central bank, however differently it may be spun. So the true loop is now apparent. We are all at the behest of privately owned central banks. They control society because they issue the money society needs, either directly to governments or to the people and businesses via their local high street banks. One would hope they are benign in their operations. Unfortunately, they are not. They perpetrate three crimes on the people that have slowly squeezed the life out of all of us. Indeed, their actions are the only reasons why we are in the end game scenario we now find ourselves in. These crimes are, number one, they supply us with debt, i.e. a principal figure we borrow, but expect us to repay both principal and interest to them. The interest owed to them does not exist anywhere in society. Number two, they are the main reason everything costs so much. They artificially drive up the prices of everything. Number three, they only have a fraction of the assets on hand that they loan out to society. Society only sees the principle of the debt owed and never the interest. The question then becomes, if the interest is never supplied, how can society pay the interest? We can't pay the interest back across all of society, except in exceptional circumstances, as we will see soon. In truth, this model should only last for a very short time frame before it all comes crashing down. After all, act as a central banker to a small circle of your friends. Give them all the same loan, but demand the loans all be repaid in full with a 20% interest surcharge one year later. Since they are a closed system, they cannot generate the interest in any way unless others join their circle to get new loans from you, thereby making it possible to source the interest the original crew owe once this fresh money is circulating. Vicious circle, anyone? This leads us on to how this obvious elephant in the room has escaped notice for over 100 years, even though the brute was wrecking the place. The reason the privately owned central banking financial model has lasted so long is that the massively expanding population of the world is exactly what has kept the corrupt scheme running. Exponential population growth. There were 1.75 billion people in the world in 1900, 
there was roughly 7 billion in 2010. This is a 300% rise. There will be 10 billion by 2100. This is only a 43% rise over 2010 levels. Therefore, the rate of population growth in the current century is seven times less than in the last century. The gross domestic product, or GDP, rise per country over the past century worked out at an average of 4% across the world. We know the economy can only grow by more money being issued into society as debt. So a 4% GDP rise only resulted from the debt that was created by the people of the earth. Hence, there must be a direct correlation between population growth and GDP rise. A 300% rise in population yielded a GDP rise per year of 4% in the 20th century. Therefore, a 43% rise in population will yield a GDP rise of roughly 0.57% in the 21st century. Recent data released by governments worldwide over the past four years proves this figure is becoming the new average. We now need to look at the existing debt commitment percentage in terms of GDP. Existing public debt obligations averages around 2% of our current GDP levels. So once the GDP percentage rise of countries is greater than 2%, then it should be possible to service existing debt, even if the interest on the existing debt was never created. GDP rise of last century was an average 4%, which exceeds 2%, hence our perceived sense of getting richer, especially in the Western world. Now, however, worldwide GDP will only rise by approximately 0.5% per year for the next century. Therefore, we can no longer service existing debt. Basically, our economy is, and always has been, a pyramid or Ponzi scheme that could only function with more and more people taking on the model, i.e. a hugely expanding population. Now that this has slowed down, the Ponzi scheme has crashed permanently. In fact, our worldwide population needs to be 28 billion in 2100 for us to have the same lifestyle we have had through the latter part of the 20th century under our current monetary model. What does this mean for us? The world is in a process of foreclosure is what it means, slowly but surely. Governments and statute law. Even before we progress to the other crimes of the private central banking model, we see that our state or governments should not allow this farce to continue. After all, they could legislate to end this madness right now and issue the money the people need, free from unscrupulous usury practices. It's really incredible that they do not, but it just goes to show how deep the lie goes and how emasculated they truly have become. As each generation of politician takes office, they quickly learn that government debt keeps growing and that they are left with no option but to continuously create new taxes and also to keep increasing existing taxes to try and sate the beast that is private central banking. The irony is that it can never be sated as the debt to them can never be repaid in full across society. The human being morphs into the corporatized entity. Common law is the law of the flesh and blood person and this dictates that you cannot transgress against another, i.e. rape, murder, assault, etc. Nor can you transgress against their property, i.e. theft, arson, damage, etc. Only when you do either of these things do you violate the law of the land or natural law, beyond which you are guilty. Then and only then is the flesh and blood person liable for punishment. Every other law, as we know them, does not apply to the human being. These countless laws are referred to as the statute laws on the books of the nation state. Crucially, it must be pointed out that the nation state is not the land, and so the laws of the state only apply to the corporatized version of the human being. John, of the Doe family, is the human being. John Doe is the corporatized entity, i.e. a part of the state. Check out any correspondence to you from any corporation or government. In all cases, you are addressed as a corporate entity, i.e. your name is in full capitals. Every tax that a government levies is enforceable on John Doe, but not on John of the Doe family. John Doe accepts his role as a subservient, powerless vassal of the state by using a revenue number, by getting a passport, or a driving license, etc. etc. We do all of these things in good faith, i.e. declaring our intentions as citizens to contribute our part to running our nation state. However, our nation state is not being run ethically because our governments have outsourced the production of money and this outsourcing has caused tyranny. Therefore, it is not unreasonable that our compliance with the state should be reaching breaking point. Why should we continue 
to accept statute law enforceable on the corporatised version of ourselves when it then forces us to pay excessive taxation via our governments back to the private central bankers. Of course, any state official would scoff at the idea that one could be exempt from this system, but this is true. The flesh and blood person is not liable for any of these taxes if he or she chooses to opt out. Only the corporatised version of you, i.e. John or Jane Doe, is liable. Another thing a state official may scoff at is the notion that all monies raised are for paying debt obligations to private central banking. They would argue it is to pay wages to public servants and to welfare recipients. Then one is called immoral and a thief by refusing to pay one share towards this noble concept of supporting fellow society members. The fear of ostracization and ridicule keeps everyone in check. However, our government only needs to pay high wages to these people because invariably these people also owe large sums of money to the private central banking model via their local high street banks that they struggle to service too. It's one huge vicious circle where the money can never get repaid across society. The cat and the rats analogy. Of course, if you have three subsets of society competing against each other so much, like the state, the people and the businesses, then eventually the strongest will win out. That is the state. After all, through statute law, they have the corporatized citizens on the hook, both financially and morally. Hence, when times are tough for them, they will simply raise their prices, i.e. taxes. The individual is left with no option but to pay up as long as they accept their role as a servant or vassal of the state. An example for us in Ireland right now is the move to both property and water taxation. If you had a rat problem, you may try to trap them and starve them. Eventually, the largest rat will kill the weakest ones for food, until he himself is the last one left standing. It's much easier then to handle just one rat than to manage many of them. That is exactly what central banking does. It traps people, businesses and governments in a game that they cannot win. Then when the pressure comes on and the debt commitment looms large, they all turn on each other. The fattest rat starts to throw his weight around. See all the countries in the world right now raising taxes, cutting services, imposing austerity etc. to meet their debt commitments and promises to their central banks. In essence, the fat rat is eating the weaker ones, i.e. us the people and our businesses. The irony, of course, is all the individual rats that join forces with the big rat of the state to go after the weakest ones, believing that they themselves are untouchable or preferred. A good example of this is the ever-increasing militarisation of the world's police forces used against the people. Time will prove their full sense of security very naive. Meanwhile, the cat, or the private central banker, is licking his lips outside the circle, knowing that he can take over at any time, and also that the biggest rat is his for the taking eventually. Nobody is immune from this process. All that separates the various subsections of society is timing. Eventually, the fat cat will have his prey. Crime number two. Central banking model causes inflation, not the people. We are led to believe that it is our rapidly expanding population that is causing the price of everything to shoot up. Irony alert. The bankers needed our population to explode to perpetrate their Ponzi scheme, but then somehow we the people are blamed for all the ills of the world. From food to housing we are blamed. We are told the earth cannot provide for our needs and we are made feel guilty for even living on the planet. If we look at the world's reserve currency, we see that since 1913 when the private federal reserve was created, the purchasing power of one dollar has decreased by almost 99%. However, the worldwide population has only quadrupled in that time as we know. Surely it is not beyond the bounds of reason to expect prices to have increased by just three or four times and not by almost 100 times in that century. If these banks issue the money, they decide the price of everything. That is a hell of a lot of power to grant individuals. If one had that power, the temptation is there to issue a lot of money very easily for goods like housing to raise the prices artificially. Then the price rises can be explained on rapidly increasing population levels. If a lot of money is issued, it makes it harder to pay it back. If it is harder to pay back, then the people, businesses and governments go into foreclosure quicker and you, as the central banker, get to seize their real physical assets for failing to meet their debt obligations. Number three, fractional reserve banking. In the past few decades, we left all gold standards. We entered the real realm of fiat currency. Fiat basically means let it be so. It means money is not paid to anything solid and is only viable for as long as the people of the world accept it. This led invariably to an abu abuse of fractional reserve banking. This term is used to describe how banking gives out more money than they actually have as assets to back up any claim on that money. 
In more prudent times, the fractional reserve percentage was around 10%. This means they only had 10% of the money they gave out as loans, as assets on their books. However, during the past decade, this was shamelessly violated and often could be as low as 1%. We now know the first two sins of our current banking model. They never issued the interest and they are almost solely responsible for raising the prices of everything. The irony is that when they artificially raised the prices of everything, their fractional reserve ratio kept falling, i.e. they had less and less assets on reserve to back up the loans they were making. Let's digress for a moment and analyse a modern couple taking on a mortgage in 2006. John and Jane bought a house in 2006 and obtained a mortgage for 250000 Let's apply the facts we now know about private central banking to their case. Thanks to the blatant inflation of house prices during the early years of this century, the ridiculously high price of the house ensures both will have to work full time until they are 65, even while they try to raise a family together. Over the life of the mortgage they will pay close to 500,000 in principal plus interest. The extra 250,000 they owe in interest does not exist anywhere in society. They will have to work extra hard to try and obtain it. However, every year that passes it is harder to get it as the population swell is slowing down and hence new money is not being introduced into society as quickly as before through new debt creation. Their government will also make it harder to meet the commitment as they raise their prices to meet their own debt and high wage costs, i.e. through taxation. The bankers are guilty of violation of common law. We now know the three main transgressions the private central banks commit against the people of the world. We also know our governments use statutory law to ensnare us to help them pay back their debt when they themselves could be issuing our money free from private central banking. The irony of all this is that as long as private central banking continues to exist, it is violating natural law, common law or the law of the land. These laws stand over the rights of the individual to not be violated physically or through theft etc. The central banks are committing theft against the flesh and blood people every day they operate. Since they never release the interest on the debt they sell us, then they are demanding money in return that does not exist. If you force somebody to hand over money to service a debt that does not exist, i.e. the interest owed, then you are stealing from them, you are violating their common law rights. All this time the person has been terrified into believing that if they don't make their debt payments, pay all their taxes etc, that they are liable to end up in debtor's prison or cast out on the side of the street. That may be the case for the corporatized person, but not for the flesh and blood person. You see the flesh and blood person can reject statutory law but the governments and banks cannot reject common law. It is the law of the land and is above any corporation, nation state or government. It cannot be violated. It keeps man in check and is in harmony with the earth. Statutory law enslaves mankind and is not in harmony with the earth. Let's redraw the banking model as it should exist. Initial steps to free humanity. Use the knowledge now at hand to close private central banking in a coordinated nation to nation manner. The people could force this by waking up to their common law rights and refusing any more to be a corporatized entity of a dysfunctional state, as long as this state continues to serve the bankers. The state needs to finally serve the people, write off all the interest owed on all government and private debt as it never existed and hence is not owed. Open public central banks staffed by honest people representing humanity that are suitably qualified, i.e. not necessarily economists or accountants but those who have a holistic view of life on earth coupled with competence and compassion. Analyse every debt owed to the existing banking model in an intensive project. Write down the principal owed to the value of the actual assets the bank had when they loaned out the money, i.e. based on the fractional reserve ratio at the time of the loan. The main reason for this is that since banks cause the majority of inflation, then the person should only be liable for a share of the principal they owe. We can now look at our couple's mortgage commitment as an example. The original debt loaned was 250,000. The total due with interest is 500,000. The interest instantly written off is 250,000. The fractional reserve ratio is 10% at the time of the loan. Then the debt owed is actually 25,000, now owed to the new public central bank. Since our couple have paid roughly 100,000 in principal plus interest repayments so far over six years, admit, admittedly with inflated money, the fairest thing to do is just nullify all commitments on this principal lo loaned figure of 25,000. It could be considered compensation for common law financial crimes perpetrated by the private central banks. The deeds to their property should be returned to them and to all others in a one-off, 
legitimate common law sanctioned debt amnesty. When the private central banks are shut down, the real physical assets that they have stolen from the people over centuries need to be returned. These resources and money, amounting to unimaginable hidden off-balance sheet wealth, can be used as collateral to fund the new financial model. We should also then return to a situation where our future money is backed by real things like our environmental health, example, how healthy is our food from the ground, by assets like gold, etc, etc, in essence, by a basket of goods and standards that cannot be violated or corrupted. Now that public central banking exists, redesign daily life to deleverage the power of money. We need to redesign society as well as having redesigned our banking system. Even though good honest people now run our public banking, can we be 100% sure that incompetence and or corruption will not creep back in again over time? We need to deleverage the power of money to make its place in our society significantly down the list of priorities. Abolish most taxation as it will not be needed. The majority of taxation will cease to be needed and hence will not be levied. Remember, governments paying off debt to private central banks will be eliminated and they will need to pay vastly reduced wages to public servants and remittances to welfare recipients as these people will also be free of the tyranny of most debt. In fact, we could easily have just one flat income tax levied across every member of society of say roughly 10 to 15 percent. Paying this could be a compromise the individual makes to society and to fellow man, i.e. a continuation of statute law, albeit in a much reduced manner. This will be sufficient for governments to recycle money through their coffers to pay both salaries, welfare and also for public services. Identify the real needs of people. We should ask ourselves what are the essentials that we need in order to survive. I contend that it would be the following three things. A. Home and transportation energy. B. Food. C. Water. Wouldn't it be great if we could possibly decoupling from needing money to provide for these items in our lives? i.e. if everyone on the planet had access to these things without ever fearing they wouldn't be able to get them or ever needing money as we know it to buy them. Surely that's a ridiculous pipe dream, or is it? Release free energy technology now. Nikola Tesla knew how to give out free energy to the masses 100 years ago. He was commissioned by JP Morgan to build Wardenclyffe Tower in and around 1910. Morgan thought it was a radio transmitting tower and it was only that Tesla let slip the fact that it also beamed free electricity to people that the project was shut down. It was nearly complete at this point and stood as a silent monument to one man's greed for a long time. Tesla understood the interaction of the incoming solar wind particles, the magnetic field of the earth and the resultant electromagnetic field that is created. He was a visionary who knew that free energy was limitless and easily tapped. All efforts since then to release free energy have been ruthlessly blocked. Of course, Tesla was not the only solution provider. As if we needed further proof that Mother Earth is an infinite provider of exactly what we need, we have many other free energy formats. For those who would scoff at the suggestion that free energy exists, I would use the example of con consumer electronics. 20 years ago, 95% of the world's population used pen and paper. Now, iPhones, iPads and nanotechnology-driven devices are everywhere. Are we so naive to believe that when it comes time to recharge the batteries of these devices that technology has not moved on in the area of energy generation in a similar exponential curve? We have been duped. Free energy exists. Not only that, but once we close the private central banks, the credits that people will have built up in compensation owed to them for crimes perpetrated against them will fund this new technology in their homes for house electricity and in their cars for free car energy. Imagine no more utility or petrol bills. This is the infrastructure that can be built into our lives to deleverage the power of cash. Healthy food and water for free. Similarly, this technology investment credited back to people can extend to building permaculture and aquaponic solutions in our local community that provide organic, high quality food in perpetuity. Unlike free energy, this does require manpower to yield its produce. But again, we can offer a few hours a week each to a barter economy to ensure that we can take our weekly fair share of this food to feed ourselves and our families. This is real infrastructure that provides our needs without needing money to source to purchase the items. 
The same could be done by a massive programme of drilling water wells and using free energy devices to pump fresh clean water from deep within, within the earth. Barter economy. These two words often cause outright laughter amongst many people. Yet money itself is just a form of barter. It is just a token meant as a means of exchange. However, we have seen the carnage caused by those who own the issuance of money. We could own the issuance of some money in our communities. By this I mean we could trade with each other free from the need to use centrally controlled money. It is very simple and could be done as follows. Align into groups of 500 or so people locally. Declare any and all skills, services, goods that you are capable of offering or trading. Practically everyone has something to offer. Even the little old lady who can't do anything physical can offer soft skills, be it in the form of nurturance, guidance, etc. Set up a rotating committee of people who assign points, i.e. the equivalent of price, on these items that the people are offering for trade. Ensure the price committee rotates so the system is not abused. Set up an online trading account for everyone. Their account now credits when they do work or sell a product to others. Their accounts debits when they buy or get work done for them. Our debt is never to those who do the work for us, but to our accounts. This ensures there is a circular motion in process. Never allow anyone to go too far into credit or debit, i.e. one's account locks up when they reach a debt limit and then they have to trade their way out of it. Similarly, if you have too much credit built up, you need to spend your balance. This means the system never gets locked up at either end. A system like this puts no limit on work. In fact, an infinite amount of work can happen in it. Community work is infinite and a barter economy ensures everyone is in employment in perpetuity. This is vastly different to the current model, where work is limited to the amount of money others can get their hands on to buy the goods or services on offer. It causes unemployment and scarcity. Community trading creates unlimited creativity and values all work, not just consumerist work. It would be expected one only has to work around 20 hours per week in a system like this to obtain those extra goods and resources needed over and above those not already offered by the aforementioned infrastructure upgrades. Our local food economy could work through this system. Remember, our startup fund and rebates from the setting up of a new financial public central banking model will build a lot of the infrastructure like greenhouses, machinery, seed, etc. However, to get food in perpetuity, we will have to barter time to the model. Not all of the people, just those who wish to make it their work or who love to do it, but it will still need to become part of the barter economy. Of course, this barter economy is not mandatory. Some people would choose to rely solely on debt reduction and free energy etc. and thereafter to work in the new, much more reduced market economy. That is entirely fine, but to me it makes sense to avail of a local model that owns money production itself. Creative explosion. We have simply no comprehension of the creative explosion that will sweep over our planet when we are free from debt tyranny, have our basic needs met in perpetuity and are not forced to work excessive hours every week. Work will be a small part of our week and for once this work can be our passions. The majority of this work can be in our local communities and so we can cease to commute large distances to jobs that often just serve one purpose currently, i.e that being to keep the wolf from the door. Market economy can then be born on these strong foundations. Now, a new form of the market economy can be born on all these strong foundations. If people have all this security, the sc scramble to gather scarce monetary resources will be eliminated. It is at this point that we can introduce a monetary or cash economy. Unlike before though, it will not dominate 100% of our lives, but will more likely only account for approximately 20% of the annual commerce of any country. The need will simply not be there and as a result the majority of people will not be consumed by it. We have to do something. We are being led to the slaughter. It is only a matter of time before the private central banking openly declares, true statute law of course, that they officially own you, your property and your society. Will your flesh and blood person allow this to happen through guilty association with your corporatized self